this will really be, if not a death blow, then certainly a very severe blow to the whole idea that the federal government's powers are limited and that it's not the case that the federal government can do pretty much whatever it wants. Hi, I'm Zach Weissmuller with Reason TV. We're here with Ilya Soman, a professor of law at George Mason University, a writer for the popular Volokh Conspiracy, and author of an amicus brief in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services versus the state of Florida, which is a challenge to the Affordable Care Act and will be heard in the Supreme Court this March. Ilya, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. Your particular amicus brief really focuses in on the individual mandate. Yes. Why is that? The individual mandate is probably the single biggest issue that's at stake in this case. What the individual mandate does is it requires virtually all Americans to buy government-approved health insurance by 2014. Uh, this is important for two reasons. One is that this is a very important piece of legislation in and of itself. It has a huge uh, potential impact. Second, it's important down the line uh, because if the federal government wins uh, this litigation, then they will have the power not just to impose the individual mandate, but also to impose almost any other kind of mandate that Congress might care to adopt. Even the broccoli mandate that many people have talked about requiring people to buy broccoli. And could you explain to us what the broccoli mandate is? <laughs> A lot of people have been talking about that. The same kind of reasoning that the federal government is using to claim that the health insurance mandate is permissible under the Constitution could equally well justify a mandate requiring people to buy buy broccoli uh, or to buy a car, a movie ticket, Harry Potter novels, pretty much anything you want. Uh, the exact same reasoning would justify these other kinds of mandates. The objection you hear from the other side is that when you talk about ma the government mandating that we all eat broccoli, it's never going to happen. That's totally ridiculous. And we have to trust Congress to be able to make reasonable legislation. Wh why is that not a fair rebuttal to that. If we really believe that we can trust Congress, why not? Why have any constitutional limits on government power at all? You can always say, well, we don't need those limits because uh, the politicians are reasonable, or if they're not, the voters will punish them for doing bad things. The fact of the matter is that both Congress and state legislatures have a long history of abusing their powers. That's one of the reasons why we need constitutional limits on government power. Moreover, uh, the problem that you have here is that actually there's a lot of industries that have a lot of lobbying power and a lot of of, uh, interest group clout uh, that could promote mandates for themselves and all of them, many of them at least, could tell a plausible story about why this is somehow in the public interest. Even with the broccoli mandate, uh, you make fun of it, but actually uh, broccoli is good for you, right? And there's a lot of data which says that your diet actually has a much bigger effect on how healthy you are than even the kind of medical care, the medical care you get. So Congress could plausibly say, well, maybe not a broccoli mandate, but we have a health food purchase mandate says part of our program to try to reduce uh, obesity and improve health, and that will actually save on healthcare costs. Your brief uh, focuses a lot on what's called the necessary and proper clause in the Constitution. The Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into powers vested by the Constitution in the government. Why does the necessary and proper clause play a big role in your brief? The necessary and proper clause is one of three arguments that the federal government is making claiming that this law is within the power allocated to Congress by the Constitution. Unfortunately, uh, the Supreme Court has for a long time now defined necessary as not the way you and I use the word necessary, something that's actually really needed, but as just anything that might be in some way useful or convenient for carrying into execution one of the other powers, which of course could be almost anything. The point that we make in our brief is that although it may be that almost anything can be considered necessary, including the individual mandate, it doesn't follow that it's also proper. Remember, it's the necessary and proper clause, not just the necessary clause. Is there really a legal definition of what is proper? I mean, haven't we already gone beyond all sense of propriety in government action? The Supreme Court has never in 200 years given us a definitive statement on what is meant by proper, but they have said in several cases that the requirement of propriety is 
is separate from that of necessity. So even something which is necessary need not be proper. Exactly what proper means is a complex question. But in our brief, we focus on one crucial aspect of it, which is that at the very least, uh, a law is improper if the argument in favor of it would give Congress virtually unlimited power to do almost anything it wants. Because if Congress has virtually unlimited power, that makes a hash of the entire balance between the states and the federal government. And it also renders many of Congress's other list of enumerated powers completely superfluous. OK, but I think a lot of people think that the government's already there. They already control so much of our activity. What is it about the individual mandate that is somehow different uh, in, in kind than uh, what sure. the government does now? With the individual mandate, what is being regulated? Well, it's simply the state of not having health insurance. And when you don't have health insurance, that's not producing a commodity, it's not consuming a commodity, and it certainly isn't distributing a commodity. So even under Gonzalez versus Raich, which is a very broad, I think very wrong-headed decision, uh, nonetheless, you would have to go even farther than that. There's been a lot of talk about the Gonzalez versus Raich case, the medical marijuana case, because Scalia came down with the majority in that case, and people think that that indicates he is going to possibly rule uh, in favor of upholding the individual mandate. He may or he may not, but it's very easy to distinguish the two cases. In their view, having this medical marijuana is economic activity. They define economic activity as the production, consumption, or distribution of a commodity. Uh, that's very broad. I think that decision is a terrible decision, but even that doesn't go far enough to justify the individual mandate. In his concurring opinion, in the Raich case, his separate opinion where he said, I don't agree with the majority's reasoning, but I do agree the law is constitutional, he used the word activity 42 times in describing what it is that Congress has the power to regulate. Here, they're not regulating any kind of pre-existing activity. They're just regulating the state of not having health insurance, which is really a form of inactivity. I think Scalia got it wrong in Raich. He should have voted the other way, but he can easily vote to strike down the mandate without taking back anything that he said in Raich, and perhaps he will do that. Another Another big claim from the other side is that the healthcare market is a special market because everyone is inevitably going to need healthcare. So actually by mandating everyone buy healthcare, it does not necessarily affect the regulations in other markets. Do you think that that is valid or is there no. something wrong with that logic? Yes, there is something wrong with the logic, namely that the exact same logic can be used to justify any other mandate. Notice the bait and switch here, that they're shifting the focus from health insurance, which is what you're actually being required to buy, and everybody knows that not everybody uses health insurance. If they did, we wouldn't need the mandate in the first place. To, so they're switching the focus to health care. Uh, and a similar bait and which can justify any other mandate. Uh, consider a car purchase mandate. Not everybody drives cars, but everybody's in the market for transportation. Even if you just walk around, you're using shoes to help propel you, right? Now, if this ruling goes against you, what negative consequences might we expect? This will really be, if not a death blow, then certainly a very severe blow to the whole idea that the federal government's powers are limited and that it's not the case that the federal government can do pretty much whatever it wants. And I think in a constitutional system of government where we have good reasons for distrusting the political process and distrusting politicians and the like, uh, that that's not a desirable outcome. And it's also not an outcome that's uh, consistent with the letter or the original meaning or the spirit of the Constitution. Are you optimistic that the court's going to give a good ruling on this? I'm more optimistic than I used to be. But I still think the odds are more against us than in favor of us. Because if you look at who's on the Supreme Court right now, the four most liberal justices have made it clear that they are not willing to impose any significant structural limits on federal power. So we would have to win every single one of the five other justices to get the majority we need. Those five conservative justices have sort of been fractious on these issues. Uh, and if we lose even one of them, then we lose the case. That said, however, uh, I think we do have a decent shot. I think if you look at some of their statements over the last several years, it's clear that those justices, including the key swing voter, Justice Kennedy, do not want to create a situation where the federal government has unlimited power. So it seems likely that they would only vote to uphold the mandate if they thought that there's a way to do so without licensing virtually all other mandates. Mm -hmm.